Hi, I'm Cheryl and I am the Carb Addiction RD. Before I joined the practice of Dr. Sivas, I worked at a CrossFit gym. Many of my clients there wanted to know how much protein they should consume. Now this makes a lot of sense for a population who are trying to gain muscle, but it's also important for people who are going through weight loss regimens or for those who want to age without losing their lean mass. Now we have different governing bodies who recommend certain amounts of protein, uh, but these amounts are not as consensus driven as you might think. As you have recently heard from Dr. Sivas, further evaluation of what you are doing in terms of protein intake and how well it is working for you specifically can be done through an assessment of your labs. I'd like to talk today about protein requirements, but to start, let's back up a bit and examine what protein is. There are three macronutrients in our food, protein, fat, and carbohydrate. These are called macronutrients because we need relatively large amounts of them, unlike micronutrients like vitamins and minerals of which we need lesser amounts. Food items have differing ratios of each macronutrient. For example, steak contains protein and fat with very little carbohydrate, while an apple is mostly carbohydrate. Proteins are made up of building blocks called amino acids, of which there are 20 different kinds. Imagine that amino acids are beads and proteins are assembled by making a strand of them. A typical protein is made up of 300 or more amino acids with a number and sequence specific to each protein. Interactions between amino acids, much like magnets, determine how it will fold in upon itself to develop its own unique shape and properties. So let's say you eat something that contains protein. For example, a steak. You will break down the proteins to the constituent amino acids. These will be absorbed into your bloodstream and carried throughout your body to your cells, which will then take up these amino acids and use them to assemble the proteins that they need. Carbohydrates and fats contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Proteins and their amino acids are different in that they contain nitrogen as well. On the left in this image, you see the generic structure of an amino acid. Each one has an amino group, which means it has nitrogen. They also have a carboxylic acid group and an R group that is different for each amino acid. On the right side of this image, you can see that there are 20 different amino acids, of which nine are considered essential, meaning we cannot make them ourselves and thus need to obtain them from the food we eat. We can easily make non-essential amino acids ourselves, and the conditionally non-essential amino acids are ones that we can generally make, but under certain conditions we cannot make enough. There is likely an evolutionary advantage behind removing these long pathways required to synthesize the essential amino acids from scratch ourselves. By losing the ability to make them and relying on the environment to provide these building blocks instead, we can reduce energy expenditure. This situation provides a survival advantage. However, it also creates a dependency on other organisms for the essential materials we need for protein synthesis. Our bodies have thousands of different proteins, and these are constantly being broken down and replaced, a process referred to as turnover. The breakdown of proteins is called catabolism, and the manufacture of new proteins is called protein synthesis or anabolism. The manufacture of new proteins requires a continuous supply of amino acids. Unlike fat and carbohydrate, we do not have the ability to store amino acids in any great quantity, and thus we need a regular supply from our diet, or we will cannibalize our own muscle to get them. Protein is essential for cellular and tissue growth, and so adequate supplies are essential during times of growth or increased demand such as pregnancy, lactation, childhood, and adolescence. And I would also add that protein needs are greater when you are trying to undergo tissue repair after an injury or illness. We need protein for many different body processes, including to facilitate chemical reactions as enzymes, to support our immune function, to support the regulation and expression of DNA and RNA, for the movement of essential molecules around the body, as precursors to hormones which coordinate body function, for structural support, as well as for muscle contraction and movement. Both animals and plants provide protein, but they differ in their amino acid content, bioavailability, and digestibility. Most animal-based proteins will contain all 20 amino acids and thus provide all the necessary building blocks. However, many plant-based proteins do not. 
When a protein does not contain much or any of a specific amino acid, it is said to be the limiting amino acid. So any body protein requiring that amino acid simply cannot be made. Thus, animal-based proteins are considered to be of higher quality than most plant-based proteins. For example, one cup of kidney beans has 0.1 grams of cysteine, which is only 27% of the recommended dietary allowances, or RDA. Not having enough limits our body's ability to produce glutathione, a very important antioxidant that protects our cells from damage. That's okay, you say, cysteine is non-essential, meaning that we can make it endogenously. But we make cysteine from methionine, and kidney beans have only 0.2 grams of methionine, or 37% of the RDA. The RDA for methionine plus cysteine is 19 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day for adults. This would be about 1.3 grams per day for a 150 pound person. In order to achieve that, you would need to consume four cups of kidney beans, or about eight ounces of ribeye, or one scoop of whey protein powder. That's quite a difference in food volume. The 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans Advisory Committee called for a shift to a more plant-based diet, but four cups of beans contains 878 kilocalories. Eight ounces of ribeye contains only 490 kilocalories, and one scoop of whey protein only 224. Now, I don't really like to talk about calories. I don't believe they are a very meaningful measure. However, four cups of beans is a very large amount of food to consume, and may leave little appetite for other valuable micronutrients. So most people probably don't even realize that we have dietary recommendations for individual amino acids and instead rely on advice for total protein intake. Well, I believe this oversimplifies things by not considering that protein quality, digestibility, or absorption. Let's see if we can find the Goldilocks amount that we need. Remember that in acute situations such as grave illness or fasting, we can break down that muscle tissue to provide needed amino acids. Too little protein long-term, however, is problematic. Protein deficiency leads to serious symptoms such as stunted growth and cognitive impairment in children, muscle wasting, low serum albumin, which can cause edema, endocrine imbalance, advanced aging, and other ill effects. In excess, however, dietary protein will be converted to body fat since we have no means of storing amino acids. Our bodies are designed to never waste things since historically there could always be a famine around the corner. Thus, as Dr. Sivas has recently described, excess protein, or protein lacking some amino acids, will be shunted towards energy use as glucose or ketones, depending on the amino acid, or to glycogen and fat storage, rather than towards the manufacture of body proteins. Current guidelines recommend that healthy adults consume 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day of high quality protein, but they fail to define high quality protein. However, they do recommend or do acknowledge that athletes need more, as do older populations, in order to prevent sarcopenia, which is the loss of lean mass with age. So back to our example of the 150 pound person. In order to get that weight in kilograms, we need to divide by 2.2, and that would give us a weight of 68.2 kilograms. Multiplying that by 0.8 tells us that this hypothetical person, air quote, needs to eat 54.5 grams of protein, which again is achieved by eating four cups of kidney beans or an eight ounce ribeye according to the USDA nutrient database. But where did this recommendation come from in the first place? Scientists in the field of nutrition have long sought the answer to the question of how much protein is really needed to support our physiological and metabolic needs. Early estimates were purely observational. In 1840, Justice von Liebig noted that Germans who performed moderate physical work consumed approximately 120 grams of protein so that became the first dietary recommendation for protein intake. Leading nutritionist for the USDA, Wilbur Atwater, agreed, recommending 125 to 155 grams, a greater value because he believed that Americans worked harder than Germans. At this time, it was believed that protein was actually the source of body energy. 
Once scientists were disabused of this notion, the hunt for metabolically required nitrogen levels was on. In 1904, Russell Henry Chittenden challenged the high estimate for protein needs and concluded that 59 grams per day was sufficient based on nitrogen balance studies. These take advantage of the fact that only proteins have nitrogen and all proteins contain nitrogen. Thus, if we know how much nitrogen goes in and how much comes out, we know how much was used in between and thus can, in theory, calculate daily protein needs. In 1936, the League of Nations was alarmed by the disastrous impact of the Great Depression on health and nutrition and so undertook the creation of the first official dietary guideline for protein consumption, set at one gram per kilogram per day for adults. The value had an appealing simplicity, but had no scientific evidence whatsoever to support it. By the 1940s, it was recognized that proteins were made up of individual amino acids. William Rose performed new nitrogen balance experiments to determine the necessary quantities of each essential amino acid, then extrapolated to generate a protein requirement of 44 grams per day. In 1957, the United Nations published recommendations of 0.35 grams per kilogram per day, again based on nitrogen balance studies, which was then increased to 0.89 grams per kilogram per day in 1965 as worldwide fear took hold of kwashiorkor, which is protein malnutrition. Meanwhile, controversy swirled as many researchers questioned the validity of these conflicting nitrogen balance tests. After years of seesawing recommendations, the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institute of Medicine and the Dietary Guidelines for Americans has settled on a value of 0.8 grams per kilogram per day for healthy adults. We continue to use nitrogen balance studies because there is no viable alternative. However, the problem is nicely summed up by the 19th century physiologist Claude Bernard who remarked that one cannot hope to understand what goes on in a house just by analyzing what goes in the doors and out of the chimney. That is, we have no real idea how many amino acids you need in any given day to replenish your hormones, cellular components, enzymes, or muscle tissue. All we have are guesses. All of that notwithstanding, when it comes to muscle preservation and growth, we're beginning to be able to make some more educated guesses. When you have fasted, such as overnight, you will naturally be in a catabolic state. That is, you're going to be breaking down your body proteins more than you are building new ones. The same is true when you undergo exhaustive exercise, such as weightlifting or running. The goal here is to return your body to a state of anabolism in order to grow or at least preserve muscle tissue. Researchers have found that the amino acid leucine specifically promotes the initiation of muscle protein synthesis by activating the mechanistic target of rapamycin, otherwise known as mTOR, which is downregulated during catabolism. Leucine is known as a branched chain amino acid, a supplement many bodybuilders use post-workout. Recent work suggests that we may need as much as 3 grams of leucine in our first meal to initiate this process. This would be achieved by consuming approximately 30 grams of a complete protein to ensure adequate supplies of all amino acids. So an example would be a meal of four eggs and four rashers of bacon, and that would meet all the requirements we have so far discussed, including leucine needs of three grams, protein needs of 30 grams, cysteine plus methionine needs of 1.2 grams, and it would contain all 20 amino acids. You can thus be quite confident that your muscles will regenerate and the amino acids will be put to use to build your body's needed proteins. That said, nobody can tell you how much protein your body needs in any given day. There are simply too many variables. Your personal goals will determine how many times a day you have a meal with this much protein. But research suggests that we can only utilize between 30 and 60 grams of protein per meal so anything above this will, as you now know, be used for energy rather than protein synthesis. Of course, that's a very large range, but keep in mind that if it is true that you need at least 30 grams of protein to initiate protein synthesis, then probably bagels are not the greatest choice for your first meal. 
Instead, aim to get 30 grams of complete protein at a minimum, and of course, get your labs read by Dr. Saivas so we can evaluate how you're doing. People trying to gain lean mass or prevent sarcopenia might benefit from having three or even four such meals to spread out their protein intake and maximize muscle growth and retention, while someone in weight loss mode may choose to eat two or three times to minimize hunger. And of course, some people have success with only one meal per day. This may come down to a little bit of trial and error on your part. But please make sure that at the very least, your first meal has 30 grams of protein so you can flip that switch from catabolism to anabolism. And hey, maybe mom was right and breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Thank you for listening and please reach out for a consultation if you need specific guidance on how to choose how much protein you should aim to consume or how many meals per day might work best for you.